Greetings. I'm Donna Boswell, a proud graduate of Wake Forest University, university trustee, and co-chair of the Advisory Committee on Naming. For the past several months, the Advisory Committee has pursued its charge of bringing the various components of Wake Forest shared governance together to help our community expand the narrative of our university. This work includes examining meaningful ways to contextualize, remember, and honor individuals today as we tell the story of Wake Forest. We've reached some important milestones in this past year thanks to the engagement of the alumni, faculty, staff, and students who have dedicated their time, talents, and care to these projects. President Nathan Hatch's announcement on May 7th was another step toward opening the narrative of Wake Forest to ever more members of our community. The community discussion we've engaged in has engendered deeper understanding of the characters who shaped Wake Forest in its earliest days and the situations and opportunities that shaped their lives and decisions in the Civil War era of our nation. For each individual involved in considering our founding period, it's been a personal journey as much as it's been a collective journey for Wake Forest. In this year of 2021, I would not be surprised if most of us hear an anxious interior argument to the theme of this discussion. Indeed, I've wrestled with it as I've talked with friends and fellow alumni. Like courageous keepers of the Wake Forest mission before us, we must set aside worries about how this or that faction might try to absorb what we do into its own agenda. Instead, see our students Empathize with what our students see in this matter, all of them, each of them. See them through the lens of pro humanitate, each of us attempting to recognize the full potential of being human, each of us recognizing and supporting others doing the same. Over the past decade or so, our students, faculty and staff studying Wake Forest history have unearthed more facts and created more transparency about prior leaders' decisions and priorities. Decisions and priorities that do not stand as exemplars of pro humanitate. Meanwhile, after decades of bearing silent witness to courageous inroads by small numbers of students and a handful of faculty, the confluence of events in the 21st century brings us to a full realization that if we are to be true to our ideals, and if we are to be able to recruit students who will be future leaders in business, art, law, science, literature, design, health, religion, and global politics, a Wake Forest education must meet the needs of this larger, more diverse population. Now, we face an opportunity to take a small step toward ensuring that this goal can be reached by our university, to show that our ideals are not empty rhetoric. This step is in service of a homily most of us learned before kindergarten. Tell the truth. It's no use to hide the facts, even if they're embarrassing. Then remember so you don't make the same mistake again. The ongoing expansion of human knowledge has led Wake Forest leaders to expand Wake Forest into a school where the descendants of Isaac, Jim, Lucy, Caroline, Pompey, Emma, Alec, Rose, Martha, Lexi, Lender, Johnson, Anderson, Mary, Sarah, Lettuce, Phyllis, Patience, George, Harry and wife, Ted and wife, Jones's two children, Anne and two children, Aggie and children, Venus and child, are today as entitled to the privileges of a Wake Forest education as the descendants of Waite, Hooper, White, Wingett, Pritchard, Taylor, Petite, and Royal. The students at Wake Forest are descendants of people who did not regard one another as members of the same class, and for some of their ancestors, not as members of the same morally evolved species. In keeping with our ideals, Wake Forest invites people from different families who have grown up in differing circumstances to become students at our university. We expect them to form an inclusive community where our kind of education can empower them to be leaders in the diverse multicultural world of the future, their future. Moreover, we invite each student to grow into being an alum of Wake Forest, to be proud of their experiences and accomplishments as members of this community, to be able to express pride in its heritage, 
its traditions, as our students say. For this to come true, the stories that they tell to make the dry facts of the past, good and bad, have meaning for their endeavors today, must be their stories. If we insist on telling them conflicting stories by naming their campus places to honor men whose actions cannot be reconciled with what our students are trying to build together, we make the Rinalda campus an obstacle to their educational endeavors. We've worked hard under the administration of President Hatch to shape a new chassis, an operational framework for carrying out Wake Forest mission and living our values in today's world. We still have much to do, but I believe we've helped Wake Forest build programs to support today's faculty and staff, inspire and empower the young people who join our community. To know, inspire, and empower them to know and trust the core values that will enable them to make hard choices, to be calm in the face of faux drama, to be resilient in the face of challenge, to have empathy for their fellow human beings, to become leaders of character in their communities. You see the same valuing of character building education in sharp focus when previous generations of Wake Forest leaders have confronted the challenges of their day, sometimes at a personal cost. I think the decision we take today has much in common with our predecessor's bold decision to leave the increasingly too small, comfortable security of their beloved rural town and campus and relocate the college to the bustling city of Winston-Salem. Wake Forest leaders who made the decision to move were empathizing with the needs of their students and faculty as educators rather than clinging to the physical setting of their fond memories. How do we find a basis for honoring what came before? You felt it as your thoughts have turned to think about our aspirations for our educational model. It's been here all the time, if sometimes eclipsed by urgent matters. In a speech at Founders Day Convocation, February 6, 1992, Provost Edwin G. Wilson said, from our founding, we have been a place which has honored teaching. teaching defined not only through the familiar process of lecture and seminar and laboratory, but through those conversations between teachers and students in and after hours, which bring to the developing mind illumination and insight and a new unfolding awareness, which is a kind of joy. To offer someone this kind of education is worthy of honor. But on that day, Dr. Wilson also invoked the goodness that people can show in the face of evil. Dr. Wilson asked his audience to think of Eleanor Roosevelt, a pioneer for social justice, and Ellie Weasel, Holocaust survivor who called on people to testify and bear witness to the atrocity of genocide, and Martin Luther King, whom he quoted, one day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right if the head is totally wrong. Dr. Wilson invoked Eleanor Roosevelt, Ellie Wiesel, and Martin Luther King not only as role models, but also because each of them had stood where he was standing, in Waite Chapel, whose cornerstone at Rinalda was laid in 1952 as part of building and moving Wake Forest to this new campus home. Each of these global leaders had accepted an invitation to come to our most sacred central gathering place to exhort the Wake Forest community to consider our own potential to be confident in our moral values and to take action in our world. Dr. Wilson described the quality that was desired as goodness. In our time, I think Isabel Wilkerson's term empathy more poignantly frames the desperate need to see humanity, to offer each person the opportunities of education. The fact is, Washington Manly Wingate and his board did not honor teaching for any subset of humanity in banning a respected textbook used by his predecessors at Wake Forest. He did not exemplify goodness or empathy in treating human beings, families, as commodities to be sold to the highest bidder. That our founders undercut their own ideals is a fact. We must remember lest we make equally egregious compromises. Be confident in our shared commitment to education that enables one to live pro humanitate, even in this crazy world. 
I believe that in doing so, we bring back to a place of honor what Dr. Wilson honored with a poet's flourish in his 1992 remarks, quote, the magical interplay between teachers and learners that invites trust and friendship. Thank you.